talk to you guys about uh, for Advent Sunday, but we're going to go a different direction and just follow um, the leading of the Lord um, this morning. And so I'm going to ask you guys, wait a minute. Oh, that's the bad thing about technology. It acts up sometimes. So let's go ahead and we're going to pray, have our confession, then we're going to get into the Word of God uh, this morning. All right? Father God, we just say thank you for allowing us to still be on this side of the dirt this morning because it didn't necessarily have to be so. And we are here and we are alive because you are not done and your plan for our life has not yet been fulfilled. And so we thank you, O oh God, for a day filled with goodness and mercy and grace, a day maybe to correct something that you told us to correct yesterday, maybe to do something that you told us to do that we didn't do. And so thank you for giving us another chance. Now, we've gathered together this morning as your sons and daughters around your holy word, a word that is forever settled in heaven. And we believe that your word has the power to transform and transfigure our lives. And so we pray, Father God, that our ears would be open, that our minds would be able to understand. But the most important part of the whole equation is that our hearts would be in a place to receive because you are the God who declared that I am able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think, but it's according to the power that works on the inside of us. And so, God, I pray that for a moment you would cause us to just pause and reflect and to examine our own selves. And if there's anything we need to lay down, God, we're going to lay it down right now so that your word can work in our lives. We thank you for that. Now, you told Jeremiah the prophet, you said that uh, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you, I called you, and I sanctified you. And so, Father, my prayer, it never changes. The thing that you saw me doing before the foundation of the earth, the thing that you planned and purposed that I should do before time ever began, I pray that it would manifest itself here on this Sunday morning in the presence of your people. And in so doing, we want only one thing to take place, and that is your name to be glorified in the midst of it all. And so we thank you, Father, and we believe that we have received everything we just asked for in the wonderful name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, amen and amen. Please take your Bibles or any electronic devices that you may have with you this morning. And let's go ahead and have our confession of faith. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do exactly what it says I can do. I am a believer. I'm not a doubter. I am a doer and not just a hearer. This is the word of faith for my life. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I shall be all the better after having heard God's word. If you believe that, give him one more praise. For you. Stand with me one more time uh, while we take a look at a couple of scriptures um, that I want to read into your hearing this morning. Um, and I think both of them are, are pretty familiar, uh, familiar to you if you've been around um, the church for a little while. And um, in the book of Proverbs, the father is speaking to his son, and he tells him this in Proverbs chapter 4, 20 through 23. It says, my son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear to my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Leave that scripture right there. Two things. Keep thy heart. That's your responsibility. And then it says with all diligence. I was researching that word diligence, and if I could paint a word picture, picture, it would be of a guard, a person who stands guard, and they don't sleep, they don't slumber, they're always checking their responsibilities, and they're vigilant over what they're guarding. And so he says, keep your heart with all diligence because everything that God is going to do in and through your life will flow out of your heart. That's why David said, Lord, he said, create within me a clean heart and renew a right spirit. Let's go to the second verse. Now, the second verse is a little bit more complicated, but I want to give you um, some context. Let's read it first. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro to show himself strong in behalf of those whose hearts are perfect towards him. 
Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. Um, you guys may be seated. I've, I've preached this before, um, but the Lord got on me about preaching it again at the end of the first quarter because I don't know about you, but um, I don't want to miss anything that God has for me. If there's anything that God wants to do in and through my life, I want to make sure that I am positioned both physically and spiritually for him to be glorified in my life. And so we read a couple of scriptures this morning, and I just want to ask you guys something before we get into the meat of the message. Um, I'm at a certain point, a certain age in my life, and I'm sure that some of you do this too. Um, when I wake up in the morning for about the first five or ten minutes of my day, I assess how I'm feeling physically. Now, some of y'all young folk may not know about this yet, but when I get up in the morning, I take my time, and for about the first 10 or 15, because you don't always feel the same when you, some days you wake up and you feel sluggish, some days you wake up and you feel sleepy, some days you wake up and, and you just don't know what is wrong with you, some days you wake up and you fall down. Y'all y'all laughing, right? But I had vertigo one time, and I jumped up out of the bed with vertigo. Vertigo will slap you right back down, all right? I jumped up and fell right back down. Um, now, but, but here's the question. We, we wake up and we assess how we feel physically, but, but let me ask you something. How often do you assess how you feel spiritually? How often do you wake up or before you go to bed at night, you, you sit down and you begin to look at your heart and you begin to ask yourself, why am I feeling this way? Or, or what about when someone's name is mentioned in, in passing in a company, and, and when that name is mentioned, you may not say anything, but you feel, because you don't like that person. You feel some kind of way in, uh, in your heart. What about when, uh, when you hear about someone that you used to know, and um, they didn't really treat you well in the relationship, but you hear about them, and they're doing very well and they're being extremely blessed by the Lord. And when someone tells you about that other person that you don't like being blessed, you feel some kind of way in your heart, kind of a resentment. In other words, you don't want the blessing. You're just upset that God blessed them. How I'm talking about checking and seeing how you feel. See, I check and see how I feel physically. And, and let me take this a little bit deeper. Um, the other day I got up and my quadriceps and my hips were hurting. And I was walking around wondering, why are my quadriceps? Because I hadn't worked out or done anything. And I had to sit down for a moment and think, why were they hurting? And I remembered that the day before I had been out on the patio and I had been bending over like this, pulling up weeds. And, and I don't bend over like that all the time. And so the next day, my, I was checking how I feel. But how many times when you, when you get one of those ugly feelings in your heart, do you pause and say, God, what I'm feeling in my heart now, this, this jealousy, this resentment, this malice, God, I know that this is not supposed to be here, but God, I'm having a hard time getting this out of my system. Will you help me feel better spiritually? And I don't just check on how I'm feeling spiritually once a day or twice a day all throughout my day I am examining myself and examining my heart because you know you, you, you get to a certain stage in life where you want to make sure that I hadn't done anybody wrong I hadn't lied on anybody I hadn't tried to hurt anybody I didn't bring up anybody's name in a malicious way y'all don't understand how, how important this is to me I'm gonna give you one other example then I'm gonna keep on going the last time I preached here, um, I sent out my message early in the morning before the sun came up, and I assumed that everybody here had the message and, and had the scriptures. And if you remember the last time I was speaking, I seemed maybe a little frustrated because the, per the people in the back couldn't get my scriptures up, right? And it wasn't until after service that I found out that even though I had mailed them, the server hadn't picked up the mail. And so the young lady, she was fr I could tell she was frustrated, but I didn't know that she didn't have my notes. And so I found out about it after church two weeks ago. Do you know the first thing I did when I came in here this morning? Because I'm going to keep my heart right. I got up and I walked back there and she wasn't even there. But it was in my heart to apologize and say, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know that, that you didn't have the... Because people will get upset 
about stuff like that and, and, and leave your ministry. And so sometimes if, if you want to be right with God, take the extra step, even though it may not be a necessary step, take the step anyway. Sometimes you may not have even been wrong in the situation, but when you want your heart to be right before God, apologize even when you weren't even wrong. Just go ahead and apologize. When you want to walk before God with a clean heart, you have to see some things and pretend you didn't even see them and just keep on going. You have to hear some stuff and literally let it go in one ear and out the other and just keep on going because I can't let anybody else be messing with my blessing because it is the condition of your heart that's going to determine by and large what God can do in and through your hearts. Amen? You see, because... We look on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Um, as a matter of fact, your heart, um, what, what, whatever God's going to do in your life, it has to do with your heart. That's why I don't think most of you realize the importance or the significance of what's happening spiritually in this place and in your life right now. Let me show it to you. I want you to turn to, a, to Luke chapter 8 and verse number 15. It all starts in the heart. God is so focused on your heart until when he got ready to choose a king, he didn't look and find out whether David had degrees, uh, whether he'd taken any leadership courses or anything like that. He didn't look at, at any of those things. The, the thing that qualified David in God's eyes was not how handsome he was or anything like that, but the thing that qualified David as far as God was concerned is, is this boy has a good heart. You see, God will bless people when you have a good heart. Don't you let people hurt you so bad that your heart becomes bitter and hard and you can't forgive and you can't let it go. If you have the power to hold a grudge, you have the power to release the grudge that you're holding. Don't you walk through life handicapped because you let pride get in the way and stuff that you know you need to say, you don't say. And now a person is up here in the box and you crying, trying to jump into the casket. I mean, oh, how I loved you. Well, you should have told them and straightened that out while they were still living because guess what? They can't hear you now. Amen. Now, I want to show you this. Now, as it relates to what God can do in our lives and our heart, in this particular parable, if you go back and you look at the parable, it's a parable that Jesus taught, and he talked about a sower sowing the seed, and he said that the seed represents the word. And he said, when a sower goes out to sow, he said, there's basically four types of soil. And all four types of soil, believe it or not, are represented in this building right now. He said, there are some seeds that are going to fall by the wayside. And, and they'll never take root. They'll never produce a positive change in your life. And he said, there are some seeds that are going to fall upon stony ground. And the cares of the world and what you got to do. and all, It's going to choke the word out. Um, and, and then he said, there's some that falls amongst thorns and the thorns choke it up. But this is the verse I want to focus on because this is where I want you to be and this is where I want to be. He said, but that that fell on good ground are they which in a good, uh, uh, in an honest, in a good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. One of the writers of the gospel says they bring forth fruit, some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. So whatever you get out of the worship experience, whatever you get out of the ministry experience, it has pretty much nothing to do with God. It has everything to do with you and I and how we come before him. And so if there's no bitterness in my heart, if there's no lust, no jealousy, no deceit in my heart, when I bring a heart like that before God and I expose it to the seed of the word of God and you hear it and it hits your heart, guess what? It's only a matter of time before you change. As a matter of fact, most of us in here have changed. How many of you can literally raise your hand and say, there are some things that I used to do. I don't do that no more. There are some places I used to go. I don't go there anymore. Um, I, I used to cuss folks out quick. Some of y'all still are living under a cussing anointing, and it doesn't take much to bring it out. But there are some areas of our lives that we can look at and we can say there's a wonderful change. And, and you know what? You don't even know when God did what he did in your heart, but he did it, and all of a sudden, you changed. You, you looked at a place where you used to always be wounded. It used to always make you feel sad. 
You used to always look back at that situation with regret. Now you look back at it and you smiled because you realize that situation was not designed to break me. It was not designed to kill me. That situation strengthened me and I learned from that situation. I became wiser from that situation. I became stronger from that situation. And when you go through that transformation, that is a transformation that happens with the Word and with God. And when your heart is really where it's supposed to be with God, your heart is like a check engine light. You've heard me use this illustration before. How many of y'all have ever seen the check engine light come on in your car? And, and, and see, here's the thing. When the check engine light, I got to get to my message. When the check engine comes on in your life, most of us don't know what to do. There used to be a time years ago when you could open the hood of your car and see the engine. <laughs> Brothers know exactly what I'm talking about. You could open the hood of your car and see the engine. Now when you open the hood of your car, you're like, what is this? <laughs> and you realize that even though the check engine light is on, I am not capable and I'm not qualified to fix what's wrong because I don't even know the cause of it. And so what you have to do is you have to take it to a certified dealer. And when you take it to the dealer, if you have any of the later model cars, if you look up under the left side of your dashboard, there's a plug, a little connection that you can't see. And they t when you pull your car in, they take it and they plug a connector in that's connected to a laptop. And they do a diagnostic on your car. And that computer will print out everything that's wrong, you see. And so what happens with us, because if you think about this, when the check engine, comes on, when the check engine light comes on, the car doesn't stop working. It still works. You still can drive it. You still can go to work. And that's what we do. The Holy Ghost puts a check in. You know something's not right in there, but we keep on going. We keep on moving, and we keep on functioning. Do you know how hard that is when something, when something, to, okay, I'll give you a good example. Let's say it's not something that you've done wrong, but have you ever had a hunch that something was wrong? I just don't know what, but something is wrong somewhere. And normally when we feel like that, you know what we do is we go pray. But we don't know what to pray about. All we know is something in my heart does not feel right. How many of you have children? If you have children, can I tell you something? Sometimes something will be in here and you don't know why you're feeling it. All you know is, I, I, need, I need to go somewhere and pray about this. I don't, know, I don't know what's going on, but I need to pray. And sometimes the Lord will show you exactly what was happening. And it was while you were praying, because God speaks to us and he guides us by what's going on in our hearts. And so I don't have time to be mad with you. I don't have time to be jealous over your blessings. I don't have time to let what you say get such a root in my heart that I can't sleep at night. I can't even eat right because I'm so upset about what you said about me. Can I tell you something? Somebody's always going to be talking about you. I don't care what you do. I don't care where you go. Somebody will always find something wrong with you and what you do. If you decide to sell everything you have and you decide that you're going to go and you're going to serve the poor and, and live a life of poverty for the rest of your life, somebody's going to talk about you. And look how stupid they were. Gave away all that stuff. Talking about they go, somebody, you know, so just get used to it. The only thing is never let the voice of a critic become louder than the voice of your creator. You see, if, if we would work, if we would work as hard as we work as impressing people, if we would put that much energy into impressing God, do you know how awesome we would be? But it's because of what's going on in our hearts that we want to try to make people think we're in a place where we're not. We're always trying to impress people. And just be who you be. Anyway, I don't know how that came out. All right. So now, so let's go ahead. Now, again, it's the condition of the heart. Let's look at 1 Samuel 16 and 7. I'm going to get into this. 1 Samuel 16 and 7. God goes to Jesse's house. He goes and he gets ready to choose a king. And look at this. But the Lord said to Samuel, he said, look not on his countenance. Because Samuel had a tall, handsome son. They thought that that was the favor of God back in those days. Or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. Do you know why many folk are missing it right now, especially with the young crop of preachers that are coming up? They look so good. They're wearing Gucci. <laughs> They're wearing, what, what, what's the other guy? Um, G, who's, all the little designer stuff. The preaching has changed now. They're handsome, they got these nice haircuts, and the outside package looks good. But God doesn't look at any of that. We look at all that stuff, and we get caught up in all of that stuff. You know what God is looking at? God is looking at what kind of heart 
does this person have? That's why sometimes you can see a person that can't preach their way out of a paper bag, but they have thousands of folks coming to their church. And you'll be scratching your head. They, they can't preach, they can't hoop, they can't do none of that. And their church is packed out every Sunday. And here you are, ah, 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 doing all of that. And you don't realize God is not looking at any of your spitting, any of your slobbering. He's looking at your heart. And God knows that behind all of that, you're a wicked individual. <laughs> what y'all don't understand, you can sit up in church all your life and still be wicked. <laughs> See, don't, 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 I used to hear people say a long time ago, I'm just talking now, I'm just rambling, you know. Go, go, go to church, you can find your good church girl there. Or, or go to church, you'll find your good church guy there. Some of the biggest devils you ever going to encounter. <laughs> <laughs> are sitting right up in church with a suit and tie on and they can quote scripture better than you can. Want to come to your house two and three o'clock in the morning for Bible study, don't you follow? <laughs> you see, because God, God is looking at our hearts and how we feel. And, and I tell people this, especially preachers all the time, at the end of the day, when the dust settles and your head hits the pillow, two things, make sure your hands and your heart are clean when you go to sleep at night. Have you ever heard this? This is an old saying. People used to say a long time ago, you sleep better when your house is clean. Can I tell you something? Same thing goes for your heart. You sleep better when your heart is clean. Amen. All right. Now, <laughs> let's take a look at this. All right. So he, he looked over. He says, anyway, I'll, I'll paraphrase what God says. God says, men look on the outward appearance but God looks at the heart. One of the things that's hard for me to do sometimes, especially once we got to a certain level, we would have to hire people that didn't come from the ministry and people that I didn't know about the history, especially when it comes to the music department. Now, Anthony will tell you this. I don't care if they can play to the point that they have y'all jumping and shouting and running around the church every single Sunday. He will tell you this. What I'm going to ask him is, how are they living? What's their heart like? So many times we get in trouble in church because we put talent before integrity. We put gifts before character. Don't you ever put a gift before character. Don't you ever put talent before integrity. Because some of the most jacked up people in a church can play an instrument and just have you just jump in it. But, but how are you living? Are you listening to me? You see. And so God is looking at our heart. Now, Here's the thing. How do we check out and how do we examine um, our hearts? Now, notice I, I, I'm not talking about um, the muscle that sits in your chest, but, but how do we take an assessment of our heart? Um, I just told you one of those things, just like you check how you're feeling physically. Check. Sometimes when I have a conversation, have you ever had a conversation on the phone with somebody when you hung up the phone, you didn't feel right? You felt as though I shouldn't have had that conversation. You felt as though I shouldn't have contributed my opinions to that conversation. You felt as though I would have been better off if I had not answered the phone call. Have you ever had somebody tell you something about an individual and when they left you like, I wish they hadn't told me about that person because I was looking at that person a completely different way until you came and you told me some mess. Let me, let me just get it all out here. Okay. Sometimes being a pastor, people, let's low down and wicked. I call them grimy and slimy. They'll either send me a message or call and tell me something about one of the members past. And my first thing is, is why are you telling me about this individual? I would have never known about this individual had you not said what you said. Why are you trying to smear and tarnish this person's character? Because my eyes are no longer on that person. My eyes are on you because you are a wicked individual. You are the type of individual, <laughs> I just, you are the type of individual who will throw a stone and hide your hand and then smile in the person's face and say, key, 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 key. You ever had anybody smile in your face and you knew they had been talking about you prior to and you just wanted to slap the dentures out of their mouth when they <laughs> smiled at you? But, but you, just, you, you stood there and you held it all in and you just, yeah, yeah. You, you ever had somebody just lie to you and you just smile? Yeah, you lying so and so. Yeah, you know. Amen. But see, sometimes you have to do all of these things because you want to stay right with God. 
All right, now, so let's take a look at this. Now, um, I just had my physical the other day, and uh, everything came out all right. Still no prescription meds and whatnot. Got to get some stuff tested and whatnot and all kinds of stuff like that. But um, when, when you go to the doctor, I have this one issue that they can't find out uh, what's wrong and why I have this particular thing. But can I tell you something? The, 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 the prevailing symptom is not the problem. It's simply a symptom. Why are you mean? Why is it that when you converse with your girlfriends or other guys, they can hear bitterness come up in your conversation? Why, why is, is, is that the case? You see, when you go to the doctor and you're coughing, the coughing is not the problem. The coughing is a symptom. When you go to the doctor and you have a fever, the fever is not your problem. The fever is a symptom. When you go to a doctor and you tell them that this thing hurts right here, the pain is not the problem. The pain is a symptom. And so many times what we need to do is ask ourselves, how did I get this way? Because do you know what? When most of us are born, our hearts are pure before God. We, we, we just like little kids. I am having the most fun. Just, just I got to share this with you. I spent spring break babysitting my, my grandson. And, uh, and just watching him every day do little things. And it is, it is one of the biggest joys of my life, seeing him develop and how his parents are, are raising him up. And, uh, and, and so the thing is, is, is when, when they do that, his little heart is right now because of the things that they've placed inside him. But what happens to a child when a child has been molested? What happens to a little girl's heart when the stepfather that you brought into the house, who's really not the stepfather, he's just another uncle. And the little girl has forgotten the names of all of her uncles. But you let him come into the house. I'm, I'm, prof I'm talking to somebody. And, and the uncle is bothering with the little girl. And you are so anxious for a man and to have somebody that when that little girl comes to you and tells you so-and-so came in my bedroom last night. Rather than you standing up and being who you ought to be and kicking that joker straight out of the house or calling the police, you take his side over your daughter's side. And now that little girl is in a room, balled up in a ball, because the person that she thought that would always protect her is no longer protecting her. What does she do with that? When she grows up with that, and she becomes a woman, and now she's trying to have other relationships, but all of her relationships are dysfunctional, and she has a problem with promiscuity, and we call her a skeezer or a thought. She wasn't born a skeezer or a thought. Something happened that caused her heart not to feel or function a certain way. Um, I was watching, I watched a lot of social media, and we were, I was watching this thing, uh, The Ladies of Las Vegas. And uh, they were going to back streets that you never see in Vegas. And there were these young women out early in the morning, even on cold mornings, walking around with just their underwear on, scantily clad, just walking by the bus stops. And people would ride by, and some of them would get in cars, and some would not get in cars. And every time I see something like that, I always ask the same question, what happened to that little girl? Listen, not only what happened to that little girl, what happened to that John in the car? that feels like this is how he needs to connect emotionally with a person that's promised, that has, you know, that suffers with that kind of thing. Have you ever wondered why you are the way that you are? Have you ever thought about what happened to you when you were growing up that has caused you to behave the way that you behave? You see, now guys will understand this more than ladies. Um, how many of you have ever turned your ankle you t and you had a sprained ankle? Now, when you sprain the ankle, there are some people that weren't there when you sprained the ankle. But when you go, say you're playing ball, you're playing pickup. But when, that, when somebody gets close to that ankle, you push back. And they're like, what's wrong with you? You don't understand, that's tender. Can I tell you something? There's a lot of people in the house of God, you're tender. And you're tender because it's unresolved pain that's in your heart. Oh, my God. Do y'all know it's 12 o'clock? <laughs> And, and, and the, reason that, that, the reason that you have that tenderness in your heart is because there are unresolved issues that you haven't really laid before God and allowed God to deal with. Do you remember in John 4, 4, 
Jesus and his apostles were walking somewhere, and he made the strangest statement. He said, I must needs go through Samaria. Now, you got to understand how important this is. Jewish people had absolutely nothing to do with Samaritan. They despised them. They were looked at as half-breeds. They blamed them for their captivity and for being led into exile. They had absolutely nothing to do with Samaritans. And so his disciples tried to get him to go another way. He said, no. He said, you understand. I got to go through this way. And he encounters a woman about noonday. Now, everything was odd about this, this meeting because women gathered water two times, and they usually did it in groups for safety. Women in those days would go in the morning with large containers of water, and they would get that water and use it to wash, to do dishes, and other things around the house for the rest of the day. Then at the end of the day before bed, they would go again and get water and bring it back normally in a group, talking and chit-chatting as they go, and they would use the water for things they had to do at night, cook and clean. But this woman didn't go with the two groups normally. She went by herself in the middle of the day, and she didn't expect anybody to be at the well. And, uh, and Jesus was there. And he said, uh, he said, give me something to drink. And uh, they had a conversation, and the conversation went to water. He said, if you knew what I was offering you, he said, you'd never be thirsty again. Do you know how many thirsty people there are in church right now? You're thirsting for attention. You're thirsting for affirmation. You're thirsting to be loved. You're thirsting to belong. You're thirsting for significance. You just want to be loved. You want to be seen. You want to be appreciated. And so he says, go bring me your husband. I want to talk to him. And she said, I don't have a husband. He says, I know. He said, you've had about five others, and the one that you're with right now, he's not your husband either. Now, for some of us, we would have turned this and just tipped <laughs> and went right on back. But she stayed there, and the Lord did surgery. Now, what most of you don't realize is this morning for the last 30 or 45 minutes, the Lord has been doing surgery, and you were anesthetized, and you didn't even know you were anesthetized. But you are asleep, and he's been working on your heart while you're in here. And some of you, you're going to change. You're going to make some changes because you realize, I can't carry this weight anymore. I can't deal with this anymore. I can't even be who I'm really created to be because of this mess that's in my heart. I got to let this go. I got to get rid of this. And so you may need to call somebody. You may, you may need to apologize. But here's the thing. He said, I must needs go through Samaria. S-A-M-A-R-I-A. But I'm here to tell you today that what the Holy Ghost is telling us that are gathered here today is I must needs go through S-O-M-E-A-R-E-A. Some area of your life where you put up a fence you put up a barrier, and the Holy Ghost says, I need to tear that down. I need to repair some things about you. Have you ever noticed there are some people that come to church, they don't fellowship, they don't say hey, they come to church, they praise, and when they get up, they're going straight to their car, and they're going to leave. A lot of times, do you know why people do that? They just don't want to deal with the drama. Amen. I just want to come, <laughs> I just want to come and get the word and go home. But here's the thing. You see, because you've been hurt and you've been damaged before. Do you know that the devil is cheating you out of meeting some of the best people that you are ever going to meet in your life? You can't allow that wound or that pain to cause you to isolate yourself and never let anybody else in again. I'm going to say this and then I'm going to close. Um, yesterday, Deborah and I went out to eat and she was, she was so nice and so pretty. I was like, look at you. But I didn't tell her that. I was just thinking it, right? And... Uh, <laughs> It took a little while. We were riding the car, and I looked over, and, and, and I said, and I said, you look nice. But it was hard for me to get that out, you see. And I began, I'm, I'm talking about how you examine yourself. Why was it hard for me to get that out? And, and then, now, this may not seem like anything to you, but I went back to my childhood, and I remembered that I've never, I have never, ever, ever heard my father tell my mother that she was pretty. I have never seen my mother reach over and and, and kiss my mother on the cheek. I have never seen my father hold my mother's hand. Now, he was a provider. He provided the, the financial things and whatnot. But see, men, where we fall short sometimes is we provide all that other stuff, but we fall short on emotional support. We fall short on telling our daughters that we love them. Do you know it was a challenge for me to hug my daughters? 
y'all looking at me like, what do you mean it wasn't? Because it wasn't where I came from. And I have this thing about my wife who I love very, very much. Because sometimes I feel like if I just fall in love, crazy in love, something will happen to her. I'm not the only person that feels that way. Sometimes people feel that if they really, really just get that all of a sudden the thing that they love will be taken away. And so what we do is we reserve and we draw up and we don't really fully love. We don't really fully emote and show our emotions. Do you know why? Because our hearts have been wounded somewhere along the way. This is how I'm going to close. If what I preached made sense to you and it resonated with you, And this sermon felt like a private conversation that you were having with God. And everybody else was just a spectator. But you felt like God was talking directly to you. Make your way up here. We're going to pray before we go home. We're going to get our hearts right today. I need my musicians to give me some ministry music. Hallelujah. I don't know about you. I want my heart to be right. And there are some things that people have done to you. Some of you need to let your parents go. You need to forgive your father. I know he's not in your life. He's never owned you or accepted you. But you need to let that go. That situation that I mentioned earlier about the young girl and the stepfather and the uncle, you're sitting in this building right now today and you still haven't gotten up and moved. And I described your situation to a T. There are some men in here You're suffering from a father wound. Long time ago, your father didn't function or do something that you felt he should have done. And he spoke to you a word that you have never been able to get over. You've never been able to let him go for that. And he doesn't even know it. But you know it. And it's it's hindered you as a man. Hallelujah. Glory to God. This is ministry time now. Hallelujah. I just need everybody to pray because it may not be important to you all that are sitting, but it's important to the people that are standing here. There are some of you that are standing here right now. You will fight at the drop of a hat. It doesn't take much for you to fight. And do you know why you'll fight? Because you've been fighting all your life. You've had to fight for everything. You, you just like a color purple. What's that? All my life. <laughs> I had to fight. And you have fought so much and so hard and so long until it's hard for you to relax now because you're waiting for the next shoe to drop. When am I going to have to fight again? When am I going to have to defend myself? Because there was nobody there to defend you and all you had, you had to defend yourself. And so you are a fighter to this day. It doesn't take much for you to fight because you just don't know how to rest God you see every soul that came up not only do you see every soul that came up you see every heart you know the history of every person that's up here you know the things that they have never ever told anybody about there are some things that if you don't deal with the Lord they're going to take it to their graves But they had enough courage and faith to get up today and come to this altar. And they didn't come because of religion. They came because they realized they've got some unresolved issues, some things they need closure on. And and they've tried to get closure, but they can't. It hasn't worked for them. And so now there are people, Lord, that are standing here at this altar. And yes, they can walk and they're physically fit, but they're emotionally handicapped. And God, we need your healing because... We want to be the people that you created us to be before the hurt ever came. We want to be the man that you purposed that we should be before we were ever mistreated. We want to be the women, or they want to be the women, that you want them to be before they were ever wounded and touched and bruised. And so, God, we need you to to fix us, to fix us. Lord, we're just like the clay on the potter's wheel. You told Jeremiah one time, he said, go down to the potter's house and I want you to just sit there and watch how the potter works with the clay. Many of us are marred. Our hearts have been bruised and damaged. But God, we still have to say thank you because we're still on the potter's wheel and you're still working with us. You're still delivering us. You're still shaping us.
us, the best of who we are, has yet to manifest itself yet. And so, God, our prayers keep us on the potter's wheel. God, give us the grace to forgive what we need to forgive. Give us the grace to let go of what we need to let go of. Give us the grace, oh God, to realize that even though we didn't like it, even though it hurt us, it happened for a reason. And I thank you, God, that we may not be able to see it with our natural eye, but you're moving, you're walking up and down these aisles right now, up and down this altar. And healing is taking place. Deliverance is taking place. You're pouring in the oil and the wine right now. I thank you, God, that their latter end shall be better than their former end. I thank you, God, that from this day forward, they're going to be able to move and to free, to move freely and to be emotionally free from the hurt and the pain. I thank you, God, that this day is going to be the day that they will finally be able to lay that burden down and never pick it up again. I thank you, God. I thank you. Now, some of you are not here because of the pain that was perpetrated against you. Hear me. Some of you are standing here because you are the person that perpetrated the pain. And you're feeling bad about it because you feel like you're responsible and you were. But guess what? The blood still works. And I came to let you know that when you ask God for forgiveness, he's not holding your past against you. So if you're here and you were not the victim, but you were the perpetrator, don't raise your hand up. Just under your breath, just say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord, because I'm sorry. I may not be able to get in touch with that person anymore and talk with them anymore, but, but God, forgive me for what I did. Forgive me for my part in the whole thing, Lord. And fix me. Fix me, Lord. Hallelujah. God, I thank you for this time of ministry right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I'm, at, I'm begging you, let this be a day that they will never, ever forget. Let this be the day that they notice a marked change, a marked turnaround in their lives. I pray that this be the day that they bring their burdens to the Lord and they leave them there in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen and Amen and Amen. Come on, y'all can go back to your seats and give the Lord praise. <laughs> I don't know what happened this morning. Y'all can't see this, but see all this right here? I didn't get to none of this. And when I looked up and I got ready to get to this, it was after 12. So I have to believe that the power is in the presence of God and not in my little text message up there. And I have to believe that the Holy Spirit ministered and not Pastor Marvin today in Jesus' name. Did you get anything out of the Word of God today? Hallelujah. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, saints of God are praying. Could we, I want everybody to get sick. This is the most important part of any worship experience. There could be someone who's sitting here and you're in the church, but you don't have a relationship with Jesus. You can be in church and not have a relationship with Jesus. I want to make sure that before you leave, if you are willing and if you would like to, I'd like to make it possible for you to know him and to have a relationship with him. Now, he wants to have a relationship with you, but you have to want to have a relationship with him. And you have to realize God is not judging you. God is not angry with you. God is not disappointed in you. There is nothing that you have ever done that God didn't know about it before you did it. So there's no need to feel embarrassed. There's no need to feel ashamed. But if you're here and you want to know him, Get all of that stuff out of your head and make up in your mind, Lord, I'm coming just the way that I am. I'm coming with my struggles. I'm coming with my pain. I'm coming with my sin. I'm coming with my shame. I'm going to bring it all to you today. And I'm asking you to be my Savior and to be my Lord. No one can make that decision for you. No one can do that for you. You have to do it for yourself. Now, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, 
If you want to know him for yourself, then this is the day that you want to ask him into your life to have a real relationship with him. I want you to just raise your, your hand. Put your hand up in the air and the ushers will let me know. And I just want to pray with you. We have a, a room, a counseling room, where you can go back with some of our counselors and they can pray with you. And we can put some materials in your hands to help you get started on your new journey. I don't see anyone responding to the call for salvation, so I'm going to believe that everyone in here has a right relationship with God today. Second appeal before we get ready to go home. You are not going to understand this until later on in life. Some of you won't. Where you go to church matters. You can go to church every Sunday and still miss your destiny. You can go to church every Sunday, shout, lift your hands, and celebrate, and still miss your destiny. Where you go to church matters. God is not going to come to you. You have to come to him. And if God has told you that this is where you're supposed to be, I'm begging you, please don't delay. Don't go back and forth and have a discussion with your own self or with your friends about whether or not you ought to do it. Just go ahead and do it. There are three ways that you can partner with this ministry. If you have that kind of faith and, and you're feeling strongly about it, you can get up and come to the altar right now. We'll celebrate and receive you right now. If that's not your cup of tea, when you leave today, stop by the information booth. Going outside, ask them for a new member's form. Complete that form, give it to them. Someone from our staff will contact you. If you're really in a rush when you get home, just go to the web and Google River of Life Christian Center. I guarantee it's going to come up as your number one hit. Go to the part of the website where it says Connect. Let that tab drop down, fill in your information. We'll get in touch with you, get you enrolled in our virtual new members class. And for those of you that are going to be saved today, we're going to get you baptized in April. All hearts and minds clear. Amen. How many of you were blessed by the word of the Lord today? <laughs> now, let me tell y'all, if y'all hadn't figured this out, but this is how God does stuff and this is how the devil does stuff. You're going to be tested on what you just heard. I promise you that before Sunday, you are going to be tested on what you just heard. And you're going to have to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit and the word that you heard to get the victory in that situation. And I believe and I declare and decree that you are going to be victorious in Jesus' name. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think according to the power that works in us. To the God who declares unto you that I am able to keep you from falling. I don't know about you, but that's shouting ground. Thank you, Lord, for being able to keep me when I cannot keep myself. And present you false before his presence with exceeding glory. To you, O oh God, we give the glory, the honor, and the praise all the days of our lives. And until we come together again in this place, our prayers always for you is that God's richest and God's best be yours. God bless you all. Have a wonderful Sunday. Until we meet again, God bless you.